Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank Marcia and the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. I actually come from the 3D culture field, uh, not from the stem cell field or the neurobiology field. But uh, we published uh, a couple of months ago with my former mentor, a review and journal of cell biology, and basically we did a historical perspective of how it is that we got to what we are today. And today, actually, I think we are at a very interesting time in history. Uh, you know, organoids and organs on a chip are starting to be considered as a reliable method for a preclinical testing. An evidence of this is all of the facts that Troy gave just now before me. Uh, I just brought an example. For example, the FDA a month ago signed an agreement to collaborate with a company that is called Emulate to test organs on, it, uh, organs on chips as a possible technology for toxicology testing platforms. Okay, so when we talk about 3D cultures, and organoids, um, if you look into the reviews, I, I don't know how many of you are experts in this, but you will see that in some things we all agree, for example, what is three dimensions, and then in other things, there is a lot of uh, disagreement on what defines an organoid, what defines a stem cell. So basically, we are talking about two types of systems. Uh, you have what we call the top-down approaches, where basically what you do is integrate the different parts of the system onto a chip. And here, biologists have to interact with many other fields of research, like people from material sciences, people from microfluids, physicists. I mean, this is not something a biologist can do on its own. And basically, you integrate the already differentiated cells with all of the systems to make a chip that it has um, you know, fluids going through it. So basically this is what they look like. And this is just an example of a chip that was developed in Harvard here. So basically these guys culture human lung cells on a membrane, and then they have endothelial cells, and then they have a blood channel. So basically they have flow of a blood-like substance uh, through this channel, air through here, and they can recapitulate the microenvironment of the lung and use a system like this to study disease and then of course you can test different therapeutic alternatives. <laughs> and then you have, on the other hand, what has been going on for a long time in the biological community, which is the bottom-up approach. Now the bottom-up approach implies the aggregation of cells, so these cells can actually be, can be aggregated by the researcher, or they can come together from a small uh, tissue fragment. And when they are put in an adequate environment, in three dimensions in culture, the cells reorganize and form what we call an organoid. Actually, this slide that I took from this paper said stem cells here, but I erased it. Because I want to show you that <laughs> organoids do not only come from stem cells. So basically, in the context of the review of the literature that we did a couple of months ago, we actually define an organ, organoid as a unit of function of a given organ that is able to reproduce in culture a biological structure, structure is very important, similar in architecture and function to its counterpart in vivo. The origin of this unit is today multiple, as it can come from a fragment of a tissue a stem cell located in an adult organ, an embryonic stem cell, or an induced pluripotent stem cell. Okay, so this is the kind of pathway we have today for drug development, and as Troy said before, this is really very inefficient, and what we have to go towards, I think, is this. And this is just more data to support what he said before, that to show you the likelihood of approval of a drug when it enters phase one. So the likelihood of approval is a measure of the percentage of drugs that end up you know, in the clinic being used every day. So basically what you see that the average is 9.6%, 
And for example, for oncology, where a lot of money is invested, it's only 5%. So really, there's something we're not doing the right way. Okay, so here is, I invite you to read our review after you listen to me. And I'm just going to go through some of the key, I think, experiments or historical moments to, for you to understand how this field evolved. Okay, just to, for you to see, these are the number of publications per year in PubMed. When you put the following keywords, you can see that this revolution has become mainstream only in the last, I don't know, 15, 17 years. Before the year 2000, very few people were working in these fields. First, there was a surge in 3D cultures, and now we see that as from 2010, we are having, I think it's a statistically significant increase, I haven't given <laughs> the statistics, <laughs> in the number of papers published where you can find the word organoid or organogenic. Okay, so why do we culture cells? Okay, this is the first question. Well, as biologists, we want to understand development, we want to understand disease, we want to understand life, we want to understand why, for example, in my body, cells with the same DNA can become part of my eye or part of my foot. And this is what we don't understand, you know, how does a cell go where it goes? And as early as the beginning of the last century, people were asking these questions. So for example, this is one of the first papers that actually shows a culture system that we still use today. This is a hanging drop a culture system. Of course, we don't use these type of slides, but I actually do these in my lab to make uh, cancer organoids. And basically what Harrison wanted to study was how nerve fibers developed. So what he did was get small fragments of nerve fiber from a, a chicken embryos and he would place them on a bit of lymph and then he would this would go on a cover slip this would go on a slide with a cavity he would seal them and put them in an incubator and he would study then the, uh, how the nerve fibers would grow out of the core. As early as 1914 Thompson defined what we what he called control or uncontrolled tissue culture. Basically what he saw was that if you got, for example, uh, a limb rudiment from an, from an embryo and dissociated the cells completely and put them on glass, they would stick and they would grow in an uncontrolled way. He did not find any uh, aspects of the original organ in the cell. And basically this is what we are using today to do our preclinical studies. This has no relevance, you know, the organization or the structure of these cells has no relevance to the tissue of origin. Then in 1929, Fallon Robinson developed what we call the watch glass method. Now people started using plasma clots, dissected tissues, and cotton wool to maintain the dampness of the, the environment. And so the beginning of the first half of the last century was made mo mostly work on embryology development. until. In 1952, Moscona did a very clever experiment. Uh, here I showed it with kidney, but he did it with many organs. And basically what he could see was that if he dissociated the cells of uh, embryonic uh, uh, tissues, like the kidney, for example, of a chicken, and the cells were cultured in suspension, after a couple of days, the cells would re-aggregate and form the same type of structure that they had in the original kidney. So this is the kidney, and these are the in vitro-like kidneys-like structures. So this is not so different from what we're doing today, if you really think about it. Trowell developed then in 1954 what you call the grid method. So basically what you put here is the media, a grid, and then you put a lens paper, and this is actually a very good system to culture slices of, okay, for example, tumors. This system is used still to test the uh, drugs on primary tumors of, of human patients. And, of course, we know cells are not alone in organs. So cells are in an environment and are surrounded by an extracellular matrix. So as early as 1832, people were trying to culture cells on collagen. But actually, the breakthrough with collagen came in 1956, when Urban and Gay actually 
developed a system or a method to dissolve the fibers of the rat tail and then reconstitute the collagen to make collagen gel. So this is actually when you buy collagen, you're buying this in collagen one to make a gels to culture your cells. Okay, what they noticed when they published their first paper, they actually tested 29 cell lines and they cultured them on their collagen gels and on glass. And they noticed that the cells had a much a larger, longer survival on these gels compared to uh, the glass. In 1957, Etienne Lafarge uh, decided to try a collagenase that had been isolated a couple of years before from Clostridium to dissect a mouse mammary glands. So he first did a mechanical, you know, he chopped the mammary glands up and then he incubated them with collagenase and he obtained the first primary mammary gland organelles. So basically this is the same method we are using today in the mammary gland field. Okay, so between 1960 and 1977, people started culturing cells on collagen and they realized that they could obtain a high degree of differentiation on collagen compared to glass. But actually, in 1975, Michelopoulos and Pitot, what they did was they decided to separate the collagen from the rim of the flask. And this allows the collagen gel to float and actually the cells can then pull on this collagen. Now, in these conditions, both hepatocytes, mammary gland cells reach terminal differentiation. For example, in the mammary gland, what you see basically with the cells is that they're able to secrete great amounts of beta casein, which is a protein that you find in the milk. Okay, so at that time, uh, people were starting to use floating collagen gels, Basement membrane components were characterized, fibronectin, collagen 4, and laminin. And in New Jersey, these guys were working with a, a chondrosarcoma from which we get matrogen. So today, we get matrogen from a mouse chondrosarcoma. And this is basically uh, what you do is it, what, what now the companies do, but they extract actually the ECM from these uh, tumors. But these guys were actually studying the hyaluronic acid in these tumors and they decided to do an extraction and got these very rich laminin gels. Okay, so by the 1980s, people were able to culture cells, they could make collagen one gels, they could disaggregate different tissues using collagenase, they had characterized basement membrane components and EHAs was available, not commercially, but basically labs, you know, would ask for the tumor, they would grow the tumor in mice, and then they would prepare their own nitrogen. Okay, so why do cells differentiate when a collagen gel is floated? Well, in 1984 and 85, Eva Lee and Nina Bissell published a paper where they showed that actually when the collagen gel is floated, the cells are able to establish apicobastal polarity. And why is this? Well, this is because when you float the gel, eh, the cell structure changes and cells can produce their own basement membrane. And in the presence of a basement membrane, a cell then can differentiate. In the case of the mammary gland cells, they produce milk. Okay, so in 1987, they thought, okay, what happens if we directly put these cells in a matrix? Let's put them in matrigel and see, well, it was called EHS at the time, in EHS and see what happens. So basically, if you put mammary cells, for example, they can be primary mammary cells of a mouse, of an adult mouse, of human cells, or cell lines, and basically, if they're not tumorigenic, of course, they will differentiate, make an acinus, as you can see, this is a cross-section of a cultured acinus. This is a cross-section of a mammary duct. So the structure is just the same. And then if you treat these with hormones, they produce milk. So actually, um, by this time, you have terminal differentiation of cells. You know, this is physiologically relevant, something that you could not get in 2D cultures. So this is what the cells look like. I don't know how many of you work in the mammary gland field. And what you have is the cells organizing and then you have the death of the cells in the lumen and then in production. 
Okay, so how was it that the matrix was affecting the differentiation and production of men? So in 1991, Charles Trulli publishes a paper where he shows that it's actually the interaction of beta 1 and beta 4 integrin with laminin that enables the production or the transcription of the beta casein gene and the production of men. So basically what it is, the structure that is outside the cell, it's telling the cell exactly what to do. In 1992, uh, Oli Peterson decides to uh, cultivate, these are humans, he uses human cells and actually gets the same as in the mouse model. So basically you can have human cells differentiate in 3D matrix and when you put tumor cells, they form tumor-like structures. So basically this was defined, the growth of cells in these three-dimensional cultures actually allowed to, this is like an assay where you can actually distinguish if a cell is malignant or not according to its behavior. Okay, so then uh, by the mid-90s, we and others started working on morphogenesis using these in vitro cultures. So for example, uh, together with Mina, we worked on branching morphogenesis and studied the mechanisms, you know, the factors that regulate mammary gland branching morphogenesis. Why does, you know, a, a tube grow into the collagen and what regulates this? And this is just to show you these are primary mammary organoids. In blue, you have the nucleus of the cell, and you see that they have a basement membrane. This is laminin. And then you have the two cell types that compose a mammary duct the basal side, the cells that are positive for smooth muscle actin in red, and then the keratin positive luminal cells. Okay, so this was going on in the 3D culture. Uh, labs, no? people working on 3D cultures, nothing to do with stem cells. Now, in parallel, the stem cell field was also developing. And in 1981, Evans and Kaufman established the first cultures of pluripotent cells from the mouse embryo. In 1996, Reynolds and Ways, who were working uh, with mouse creatum, actually identify cells by these neurosphere cultures, these are suspension cultures, and they show that they, from this stem cell, they can actually produce progenitor cells that will differentiate into either neurons, astrocytes, or oligodendrocytes. In 1998, embryonic stem cell lines were derived from human blastocysts, and in 2003, Gabriela Dontu and Max Wicher actually adapt Reynolds method to do, they create what we call mammosphere cultures of, uh, that originate from mammary gland stem cells. So again, here you have the same situation where basically you have a stem cell that can give rise to progenitors that will then uh, generate both luminal and myopithelial cells. And if cultured in 3D, in 3D matrix, will give rise to both uh, alveolar and ductal structures, which are, you know, the kind of structures you find in the mammary gland. Okay, so now in 2007, these two uh, fields of research converge. And basically, what you have is the appearance, uh, the publication of papers like Eiracus, for example, where he shows the self-organized formation of polarized cortical tissues from embryonic stem cells, uh, both human and mouse. And basically, what he does is put a very high concentration, 3,000 cells, into 96 well plates, and in a couple of hours, what he sees is aggregation. So remember Moscona? It's not so different, <laughs> conceptually. This is the concepts. In, in 2009, Sato does, produces cultures of mini guts. So basically, he uses a technique which is pretty similar to what was used in the mammary gland field. He takes little uh, gut fragments and cultures them and is able to obtain these organoids that recapitulate you know, a functional intestine. 
and they also produce them from the stem cells. They isolate the stem cells and get the same result. And again, what are we doing? We're culturing the cells in 3D in a physiologically relevant environment, which is rich in laminin. Okay, so the same technology was used for the culture of stomach, pancreas, colon, and liver. Then in 2007, a IPS cells from human German fibroblasts were generated, and I think this was really a great discovery. And Lancaster's paper in 2013 is a demonstration of this, of how different you know, areas of expertise converge. And she is able to generate these brain organoids from a, a healthy people and from patients with microcephaly and actually sees that the organoids from the patients show the same characteristics of the disease in the human being. So this is really very, very interesting. Okay, so today we are here. I think we have a lot of potential in the possibility of producing these induced pluripotent stem cells and growing organoids that they are useful, of course, for disease modeling, for drug testing, and maybe one day for organ replacement. So just to go back, for you to see the amount of systems we have here to work in three dimensions, you can actually work with a slice of a tissue, you can start with an organ and you know get 3D dissociated, get organoids, little pieces of tissue, and put them in culture, and basically what you see when you put these guys in culture, is not that they stay there as they are, they reorganize. They deform first of all, and then they start to do their morphogenesis, and they recapitulate, you, you get the same if you do that, uh, or if you get a single cell and put it there and just wait. It's the same. It's amazing, I mean, well, I, I love looking at these things. Uh, you can do organoids from uh, adult stem, uh, from embryonic stem cells, or you can get the stem cells from an adult. You can sort them out, uh, or you can use primary cells, uh, as I said before, giving this example. <coughs> so I think today we are at the crossroad where I think you know it's not only the animals; it's also the 2D cultures that are making our preclinical uh, studies so inefficient. Because what, what do we do? We first test in 2D where the structure is lost completely, the signaling, if you look into the literature, you will see many examples of papers that show that the signaling within a cell in 2D has nothing to do with the signaling of a cell in 3D. And of course, uh, uh, model organisms like mice obviously are not reproducing what is going on in humans in many cases. Well, at least, for example, in oncology, I think it's only 5% of the cases. That's what 5% of the drugs get through. Eventually, I think we will be able to have systems like this where we can integrate different organs. I mean, it's very complex, but you know, I think this is where we're going. And this would be the, the, you know, the really physiological setting to study uh, you know, drug development. So I would like to thank you, and this is Mina, my former mentor, and one of the pioneers of 3D culture, so I invite you to read her, her papers, they're really very inspiring, um, and I think, I, I think it's very interesting to look back and realize you know, that the concepts really have been there, it's just a question of, um, you know, sometimes topics are not fashionable, or you know, <laughs> it, there's not a lot of funding put into them, and if somebody are seeing that you know this really is making a point, so I think it's a very exciting time actually. Uh, this is our funding for this review, and this is our city of Buenos Aires. So if any of you come to Buenos Aires, please send me an email and we can do something together. And this is our university, Universidad Nacional de San Martín, which is 25 years old this year, and you're invited as well. So thank you very much.